Welcome to this inter or interview, uh, this oral history with Mary Kay Kane, the Dean Emerita and Chancellor of University of California Hastings Law School. We're here at the um, San Francisco Union Square Hilton on January 2nd, 2017. Mary Kay, why don't you start and tell me about your growing up period, where you grew up, and what you did as a kid. All right. Um, well, I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an only child, um, and I grew up on the east side of Detroit. Um, I walked to grade school and high school. Um, I was in a, a parochial school um, that was their neighborhood. You just played with neighborhood kids. <laughs> you know, you right. did all that. The one thing that was a, a little different, which Ultimately, I think um, probably influenced some of the things that I did much later in life is my maternal grandparents lived in the city. None of my other relatives lived in the city, but they did. And my grandmother, when I was seven, um, had a major um, medical problem and a stroke that left her paralyzed for the rest of her life. And the result was my, my grandfather had sufficient funds to do this. She had to have 24-hour nursing for the rest of her life at home. Mm -hmm. She wasn't anywhere else. And so my mother, who was the one of four sisters, was the only one living in Detroit. Oh. Uh, and so my mother had the lion's share of responsibility. The result was that uh, from, so it, as I said, this happened when I was seven. Mm -hmm. um, I'd go to school, but then after school, I had to go down to my grandparents and had mm -hmm. to stay there because my mother was watching over things um, sure. there. And the result was, and my grandmother couldn't tolerate any noise, so I couldn't have any friends around. And so the result was, my mother took me to the library um, and I read voraciously. I literally got to a point um, on fiction, I was like, I'm going to go through the A's, I'm going to go through the B's. Wow. <laughs> you know, I just read all the time. Right. And I grew very close to my grandfather, um, you know, and we played cards. Um, so I sort of read and played cards. So I was a quiet, <laughs> a quiet childhood. And my grandfather died when I was 10 of a heart attack. Um, and, you know, so my childhood. In a, in a weird way, I spent a lot of time more with adults sure. than I did with kids. Sure. How do you think that made a difference for you? Well, I think it made a difference in bad ways and in good ways, mm -hmm. as most things in life. When ultimately I had more time to spend with teenagers my own age, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to deal with them mm -hmm. <laughs> because I didn't grow up with them. Sure. So I was a very shy, awkward <laughs> teenager, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, later on in my life, um, uh, it, actually, when I first went to Hastings, when I went into the profession, I could deal with senior faculty. Sure. I could do because I felt right. comfortable sure. with people who were, you know, much older than I and and had much more experience than I. I felt comfortable and I knew how to respect them, but at the same time, be able to talk with them. Right. So it kind of helped me in that respect, right. and it made it more awkward during my teenage years. Right, well, like, like, like most things. Yeah, right? <laughs> that's right, that's right. So what kind of things did you read? I mean, you sort of, it sounds like encyclopedic, but what kinds of things did you like the most to read? Um, I actually liked the most um, history, um, European history, <laughs> um, oh. but I mean, also historical fiction, mm -hmm. a lot of historical, I mean, uh, I didn't like, and this to me is sort of a sad statement about American writers at, at the time, mm -hmm. I did not like American history. Mm -hmm. In in high school, they taught it memorize the dates, memorize the places. You know, this was it. It was so dry, and there weren't any really good books about it either that made you feel like you could live through the life of right. people doing things. And it really isn't until the last twenty years when suddenly right. we had such great writers who have. And I've now gotten really into American history, but <laughs> but when I was growing up, it was boring. Whereas right. you know, Napoleon and Elizabeth I and Henry right. VIII and. Catherine the Great. Larger than life. <laughs> exactly. Yes. You know, so I could sort of escape into them and also learn about history at the same time. So that was probably my, my most interesting reading uh -huh. at the time. <laughs> so you went to private school. To, yeah, Catholic school. school. Mm -hmm. Catholic school. How yeah. do you think that sh shaped you? Um, it shaped me in one particular way, um, and that is we had, uh, and given the public schools in Detroit <laughs> at the time, right. We had homework every night, and the homework had to be in the next day. Right. Um, it, you know, you had your break periods, but then you had your work periods. Um, so it taught me discipline in terms of organizing and saying I had this responsibility. You know, get it done and whatever. And uh, and it wasn't cruel. It was just it was very that was your responsibility, sure. and you did it. Um, and so I noticed that in particular when I went off to college, um, because 
I met a lot of other people who were in college for the first time, obviously. And, you know, some of them was like, oh, wow, I mean, <laughs> it was a different world. Uh, whereas I was, yeah, this is great, but I sort of organized myself, and so I think it really helped me uh, help me in that respect. Yeah, and for um, your leadership positions, I'm sure, later on. Yeah, yeah, exactly, you know, and so um, I, I think um, I was, I really benefited from that, and the public schools in Detroit were, even at that time, not in very good shape, mm -hmm. and so it would have been a whole different environment. Mm -hmm. um, so I was lucky, although my parents used to say, it was, as I said, a Catholic school, and I was an only child, and because at that time, um, they, they obviously did not want birth control, and my parents would have loved to have had nine children, but they only had me. Yeah. Um, they had one tuition no matter how many children you had. And so it, it was like $50 a year, no matter, it was a long time ago, but still so $50 a year, you could have nine kids for $50 a year. Um, and so my parents always used to say, this is terrible, we're paying too much. <laughs> That's great. It's awful. What did your parents do, were they? Um, my mother, actually never graduated from college. So my mother okay. was a homemaker. She okay. stayed at home. Sure. My father was a solo practitioner. Oh, um, okay. He um, went to Detroit College of Law at night school to get his law degree. Mm -hmm. And then, and he worked his way through law school by working for the IRS as a collector. Oh, Probably not a popular thing <laughs> to do. Uh, and, uh, and he just, he, he helped small business. He, he was a GP. He did small businesses, he set them up, he took care of them, he did wills and trusts. He believed sure. everybody should have a lawyer. Yeah. And so he was out there saying, you really, this is before you had all the forms, if you wanted to buy a home. It was like, you yeah. really should have a lawyer, look at what right. you're doing, exactly. you know, et cetera. So he, he was very much into sort of neighborhood lawyering. So did you get to go to the office with him, or did that affect what you did later, you think? Well, I didn't get to go to the office with him. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> the, the only thing I, I ever did directly to help his law practice, he used to tell me. One of the things that I have a peculiar um, ability for is I recognize voices more than I do faces. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just very attuned to voices. And so he would always have me answer the phone at home. Um, and I'd answer the phone, and his clients would call him Saturdays. Like, you know, they were working people, you know, whatever. Sure. And I'd answer the phone, and somebody'd say something, oh, what, you know, is John Kane there? And I'd say, oh, Mrs. Marshoni, it's you. And so they were like, oh my gosh, he must talk about me. I must be an important client, because his daughter knows who I am. <laughs> so he, he used me to kind of give out this message that he really thought was going, just because I didn't realize or no. Um, but interestingly, it, it didn't at the time make me think. I, I never thought I wanted to be a lawyer early on. Mm -hmm. I didn't decide till I was a senior in college that I was even going to go to law school. Okay. Um, and the thing is, at that time when I made the decision, though, it made me reflect back on how much he loved what he did. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really, really loved it. Mm -hmm. um, and my poor mother, as I think about it now, although poor me too, uh, family dinners, the three of us would sit down and he'd start talking about some tax problem somebody had. <laughs> and I'm sure my mother didn't, I didn't know what he was talking about either, but she'd say yes at all the appropriate times, because he was just into it. Sure. You know, and so it made me realize if you could have something you really loved, right. that's really important. And law for him was something he really loved, yeah. and he felt he was making a contribution in. That's great. So let's go back a little and talk about high school. What, okay. was, what were you like in high <clears throat> school, and what, what influences did you have then? Well, um, I continued to be, that was my teenage shy period. Okay. At the same time, I did very well in high school. I was, a, a, the small, it was only in the, in the whole high school, um, there were like 100 people in each class. So there were 400 yeah. people in the whole high school, so, so it was a small school. Right. Um, I was the one who tutored the athletes who were not about to make okay. it. <laughs> you know, uh, that sort of thing. Sure. So I was sort of the friend to everybody. <laughs> um, you know, I enjoyed, I mean, I enjoyed it. I had, um, I also was very much into music at the time. I took piano and voice and organ for many years. Um, and since this was a Catholic school, I played for mass every morning all the way through high school <laughs> um, at, for 6 a.m. mass. Um, and, you know, and so it was like, because that's the only thing that a little girl played before. <laughs> you know, um, but um, so I had, a really, there was a very good vocal person there, and so we had a choir, and we had everything, and I enjoyed that, so I did a lot um, on that side. I was very into, I had a nun who was very into math. I got into math only because of her, and the thing is, 
she was way ahead of her time. And so, whereas most high schools, because we're talking in the early 60s, you know, you got algebra and, and geometry, and that was sort of what you got. She was into, I'm gonna, she had a small class of those of us who wanted to do this. She taught us some calculus. She taught us other things that were way ahead of what most high schools were doing at the time. Um, and so, I mean, I really enjoyed, I thought I had a very good education. I was very happy there. It's great. Yeah, they were good. So how did you decide where to go to college from there? Well, um, I, I applied and I decided, I mean, I wanted to go to college. Well, there are two different things to say, actually. <laughs> this is uh, irrational on my part, but it's like a teenager would make this decision. Yeah. I really thought I wanted to go into music. I really wanted to be a concert pianist. Mm -hmm. That was my, my dream. Right. And I'd won some prizes, et cetera, and so I got, actually, I got accepted into Juilliard. Um, and my, my parents said, you're not going to Juilliard because I'm their baby daughter. Juilliard at that time had no dormitories. They had not, you had to find an apartment. You had to kind of live on your own. You've never been outside the city of Detroit. We are not sending our daughter to New York. To <laughs> I mean, forget this. I mean, it doesn't matter, okay? And I said, well, if I can't go to, and they said, you can go somewhere else that's a college campus. That's fine, <laughs> et cetera. And I said, well, if you won't let me go to Juilliard, then I won't go into music, which I think made them very happy. <laughs> and yeah, they were very smart in the way they dealt with me. They made them very happy. Um, and so I said, all right, um, then I'll go into math, because I had, sure. had this math teacher who didn't spare me. <laughs> and so I applied to the University of Michigan. I'm in Michigan. It's a great university. That made sense. I applied um, to the University of Minnesota, yeah. because my father's law partner had gone to the University of Minnesota. I mean, I, it was sort of public. You know, I really didn't. In those days, people didn't take people on tours. No, they no, didn't no. do anything. Yeah. You, you know, you knew somebody who went somewhere, and That's you it. decided to apply. That's and there weren't websites to look at. You just sort of did it and hoped. Um, and I got into the University of Michigan, and I went there. Um, and after one semester in math, as my technical major, although in those days you could change much more readily than I think you can now. I said, I don't want to be a math major. <laughs> That's not what I want to do. So I switched altogether. <laughs> to what? Um, I, my major became English, li <coughs> excuse me, English literature Sorry. with a French and psychology minor, wow. just because I was interested in those topics. Sure. With no particular career in mind, it's just, that's what I wanted to study. Uh, and my, my father was sort of dismayed. I think they were happy when I went out of music, and they were happy when I went to math. This is when computers were just starting, mm -hmm. but they could even say, oh, career, I can see how a career could evolve. Sure. And when I came home after the first semester and said, I'm switching into English literature, they're like, what are you going to do with English literature? <laughs> it's like, I don't know, I'll figure it out. And they said, fine. They, my parents were always very supportive of me. I was very fortunate. So a lot of your the, a lot of literature classes, so you got a lot of read. You got to read a lot. And I think that for any law student, I mean, I remember first starting in law school that we had a number of engineers who were in our class, mm -hmm. and they were bright, bright, bright people, and they ultimately did fine. But it was a really hard start for them because they hadn't been thrown into that much reading. Mm -hmm. Whereas for me, reading, hey, I told you, I started in an early age. This was like the perfect thing for me to do. So it was it was a good it was a good choice. I had a very good, good. college education. Then. Were there any other things in college that really stand out to you as memorable? No, you know it, it's interesting. Um, I lived in the dormitory my first two years, which is pretty typical at that time. Um, and then a girl that I met in the dormitory. Uh, she and I moved into an apartment together for the last year, and I wasn't really social. Again, I still remained incredibly shy, right. and so I wasn't really into a lot of different, I wasn't into outside things um, very much, and so no, it was sort of the education that I got, mm -hmm. uh, which I enjoyed enormously, um, and that that's really what stands out for yeah. me. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what, what about law school? How did that all come up? Well, that came up actually when I was uh, a senior in college. And I was trying to decide to do what I was going to do with my degree. Um, and I had gotten a teaching certificate. I'd done all that since I realized the most obvious thing to do was to go teach in high school. Right. But I didn't really want to teach English in high school because I know most kids don't want it. So I didn't want to have a class that didn't want to do right. what you were doing. I, I wasn't ready to kind of tackle that. And I started thinking about, you know, my dad really, really loved what he did. And we used to do little debates at home, just, I mean, you know, whatever. And I thought, I don't know, I might be interested in law. I mean, it sounds, I mean, it, 
you know, and maybe I could do something with it, and maybe I, you know, I could make a difference. And so I thought, well, I'll take the LSAT, and I'll see, and I'll see whether I'll go to law school. And so I remember I went home, uh, and my father had, and my, my father and mother had never pushed me towards anything in a, in a particular direction. They both wanted me to have a college degree. When I said I wanted to go, well, when I came home and I said I'm thinking of going to law school, I'm not sure. But I'm thinking of doing it. And my concern was this. I love my father a lot, but I was worried he'd want me to practice with him. Sure. And he and I would never work well together. I mean, I'm this very, my desk is clean, I'm very organized, I have to do things in a certain order. My father's office looked like a cyclone hit it <laughs> at any given time. Obviously, he did things and they were successful, but it would have been, we, we would have been at loggerheads, sure. you know. And so I was afraid by saying I wanted to go to law school, but then he'd start saying, well, then you have to come with me and, sure. and whatever. Um, so I said, I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking of taking the LSAT, but you know, I'm not sure. And I remember, because it was a Friday night when I'd gone home for the weekend, and I, we had the conversation before dinner. And my dad said, that's all right. Well, try it for a semester. See if you like it. If you don't like it, you don't have to stay. Fine. Then as dinner progressed, it was like, well, try it for a year. If you don't like it after a year, we'll see. After dinner, he was saying, well, try it for three years. If you don't like it after three years, then we'll see how you feel about it. Um, but he didn't actually want to work with me either. Oh, so, good. So it turned out to be a very happy circumstance. We both recognized that we were not good partners in, in work um, in that sense. And so I took the LSAT and, and, and did well enough um, and decided to go to law school. <laughs> so tell us about your law school at that time. Uh, were there many women in your class? Oh no, I mean, law school, this was 1968 um, when I entered law school. It was the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. There were 425 people in my class, mm -hmm. uh, 19 were women. Um, and it was also a very, it was a very difficult time. Um, the Vietnam War was um, still going on right. um, and more particularly there had been a graduate deferment, so a lot of guys had gotten out by going to law school. Okay. That was the first year they killed the graduate deferment. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, you know, I, I remember that that first year that, you know, sitting and watching, there was a, they picked the numbers out of the draft pool, sitting and watching. And, and so the women who were there were somewhat resented by our colleagues mm -hmm. because we were not at risk. Sure. Um, and they were. And some of them actually got called up, yeah. um, you know. And so there was a, uh, it, it, it was not just a small number of women, it was a weird time mm -hmm. to say, you have this opportunity, well, this is all we want, and instead we're being shipped, sure. you know, overseas. So there was a, there was a tension um, there at that. At the Do same, you think they respected you as uh, colleagues? Um, not in the beginning. I mean, uh, uh, you know, they didn't hate us. They right. just, you know... Uh, I'll say they, they did a couple of things for um, the one University of Michigan has a law quadrangle, and so there's a living space that's around where it's at. They never allowed women in the law quadrangle because I don't think there were enough. But sure. um, they decided that year to allow women for the first time. We had separate entrances, so you had three stories, and, you know. So there were enough. There there were essentially six rooms, <laughs> so you had twelve people. Okay, sure. and I they decided to give preference to first year women, and so I got you know, a roommate in, in, in one of the rooms. Um, and so I, I tell you this because it works out there, you ate there, and at, and this is a time, an era. Um, lunch was cafeteria. Nighttime was family style dinner. The men wore ties mm -hmm. to dinner, <laughs> okay? You were to dress for dinner. And we, all the women came in the first, we'd never been able to eat there before at dinner because we'd never lived there before, right? And they said, oh, welcome, welcome. And they spread us all around, so we were each at a different table. There are only 12 of us. I mean, it's <laughs> not, not like a lot. Okay, fine. And they put us at the end of the table. Oh, that's delightful. What we didn't know is the tradition is the one at the end of the table serves everybody at the table. Oh. <laughs> so it was that kind of, you know, it was that kind of razzing, yeah. <laughs> you know. But I will say, um, you know, they also, there was a, Sophie Newcomb was a dormitory, a girls' dormitory that was near, undergraduate dormitory near ours, and that's where all the guys, but they were not looking to date any they of the women. I mean, you know, the women law students were sort of this weird breed, but they became friends, really good friends, you know, and, uh, and so, um, you know, I, I had a very good friend that, uh, between our first and second year, he was going back to Minnesota to get married to, 
to his high school sweetheart. Um, and I was driving to the airport and he said to me, you know Mary Kay, when I first met you I thought she doesn't deserve to be here, she shouldn't be here, women shouldn't be here, this is wrong. And he says, but now I've decided you deserve to be here. <laughs> I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> <meant> that one, <laughs> it'll take a while, but we'll get there, <laughs> you know. Um, and there were no women faculty okay. at all, um, uh, not even adjunct faculty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there were no women faculty. But the truth of the matter is, the men, uh, I mean, the so you had no mentors. Right. You had, yeah, and it wasn't, we didn't think about forming a group. There was no women's association. You just kind of did your own thing. <laughs> right. Um, but the men faculty members, and I'm, I mean, there were obviously always exceptions, but um, in general, were incredibly supportive. I mean, they treated us like they treated the guys, and they were, it was a tough era. But the point is, they also respected us enough. I mean, we didn't get extra hazing. Mm -hmm. We didn't get um, any kind of snide comments or anything. Um, and so, um, in that sense, um, I was very fortunate, and part of that is I was fortunate at the place I was at. I'm in Michigan. I, I know from other women that I know from that era at different places <laughs> that I was just very fortunate, sure. you know, in that. <laughs> was there anybody that was a particular mentor to you? Oh yes, um, several actually, mm -hmm. but but in particular um, Arthur Miller, mm -hmm. who was then at Michigan and then went to Harvard and then he's at NYU now. Right. Um, he um, he was my first year civil procedure teacher. Okay. And I will I will say this. When I went to law school, if you'd asked me, what do you want to study, what do you want to be, I would have said international law, because that sounded sexy and I could travel. I mean, I had no idea. I actually found out when I took international law, I didn't like it, but that was a different <laughs> issue. But, <laughs> you know, I, but I fell in love with civil procedure, and that's partly because he was a great teacher. Okay. okay. And then he hired me to be his research assistant, one of his many research assistants. Um, and so, I mean, he was a dramatic mentor to, uh, to me um, all through my professional career. Um, in addition, I mean, there were others, I mean, uh, that um, Yale Kamisar, who was there, who shared the office suite with him. And as his research assistant, you worked seven days a week and you were always working out. So you got to know, I mean, he also, I mean, I think of people who tried to support me in my career and help me when I was trying to find jobs right. and the like. Doug Kahn, um, who just retired uh, mm. at 85 uh, from Impressive. Michigan, yeah, was my tax professor. And, and he and his wife had me over to play bridge with him. I mean, so there were people who were just, you know, they were just very friendly and they really helped um, as much as they could. Um, not only give me advice, but sort of foster me along. So your, your research assistant, were there other things you did in law school beyond classes? Did you work? Did you... Well, research assistant was working. Or, yes, I, right. <laughs> Sorry. I, I didn't mean I'm to just, suggest I'm otherwise. <laughs> I know. Um, uh, you know, no, predominantly that is what, that is yeah, what I did. Okay. You know, uh, and I was fortunate to have that position because in those days there was one law review and you got on it by your grades your first year. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have them, there was no other thing There's to no do. Other way. And I didn't make it by my grades in my first year. Mm -hmm. But the experience that I had and um, all the writing that I did and the work, um, uh, Arthur Miller was then just starting his federal practice treatise, and so with so Charlie that's Wright. What you worked on. Yes, oh. that was the first volume. Um, and yeah. so it was like, okay, you know, you really were working, and then you had some a credential. Sure. And you had writing experience, and you had things, you know, he he really taught me how to write in law. He destroyed my ability to write fiction, but he helped me, <laughs> he helped me write. I mean, I thought I was a good writer. I got A's in English literature all yeah. the time, you know, et cetera. But um, the first thing I wrote for him, he just, I mean, I think there were five words left on the page mm -hmm. at the end of the, that was, uh, that was all it was, you know, it, it was. But uh, he taught me how to write in law. Um, and... Uh, you know, um, so I was just very, I was very fortunate to get the training that I did, and to be in a it just a it, generally it was a welcoming community. I mean, it was it was not easy. I mean, uh, one of the other things I will say about the guys who were students there, my first year in law school in the spring break, there in in Ann Arbor there had been a series of murders of young coeds, um, and. What it turned out is this guy would post things in the student union saying, oh, do you need a ride this weekend? I'm driving to Grand Rapids, which was a very common thing to do. I'm sure. driving to Saginaw or and whatever, and, and girls would sign up, and then they would be found. Um, and so spring break, I was staying to work um, on something, um, and so the, and the girl next door to me was staying um, mm -hmm. as well, but then she was going back to her home the next day. 
and she was one of the ones that ended up getting murdered. So the police came, you know, so, she, so there was a, law, a woman law student that got murdered through this guy who ultimately got found and actually went to trial and got convicted. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so all the law students, I mean, once that the male law students, it was like, okay, we're setting up a patrol at night. You, know, you want to go to the library, which is to walk across the quad, which is not, I mean, and he wasn't walking across the quad. I mean, right. this guy was, I had a plan and the way he did it, but nonetheless, no, no, you tell us, you want to go back, we'll walk you back and forth. Right. We'll, I mean, they were just, and even if they didn't know you, right. they set up this whole patrol system, just to, and, which I thought was really quite yeah. wonderful yeah. Uh, uh, for, for the guys to feel that they should step up and, and, and protect us. Against that. So, did you think you were going to be a law professor in law school? No. Or how did that all come no, about? No, not at all. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. What I, in, in the sense of, I didn't have a career path planned out. I loved civil procedure um, to this day, um, litigation. So I thought, okay, I want to do civil litigation, complex litigation in particular. Okay, I really, really want to do that. Which means I need to be in certain major cities, because I want federal court litigation, sure. I mean, you know, with some, something like that, or maybe in the government. Mm -hmm. um, and so the thing is, in those days, um, to get a job at a major law firm in New York as a woman was really, really tough. If you, I mean, maybe if you were the editor-in-chief of the Law Review, maybe, <laughs> you might right. get your foot in the door, but other than that. And that's when I say, like, people... Um, like the professors that I mentioned, like Yale Kemet, they called up their friends to get me interviews in New York. I didn't get them through the ordinary right. way. I didn't get the jobs either, but I mean, they got me interviews. They got my, they tried to get my foot in the door. Mm -hmm. You know, they were very helpful in that way. Um, and so I didn't get, on the private side, I wasn't really being successful in doing it. So I applied to the honors program in the Department of Justice um, and got into the honors program. And then the issue is which division you're in, and I wanted the civil division because I wanted to do basic civil stuff. And the irony was that um, a proper, my property professor had been Tom Kuiper in my first year, and he'd gone off to be the head of the antitrust division, mm -hmm. um, just you know, on his two. And he he heard him say, "Oh no, 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 I want her for the antitrust division." And I said, I don't want to go to the antitrust division. I really don't want to be buried in all the stuff you've got there. I don't really, but that was the offer I was getting. So I was in a quandary about what I was going to do. Sure. And at that time, what happened was, um, and so I wasn't, again, I, I'm not thinking about law teaching. I'm trying to figure out what it is I'm going to do. And Arthur Miller had written a book called The Assault on Privacy, mm -hmm. which was uh, for the general public, um, all right, about, um, Computers, uh, which was uh, way before computers are what they are today, but okay, but ahead of that. Um, and he, uh, and I edited the book for him, um, and then he had NSF contact him because the um, NSF was worried about human subject research and all these groups doing this without having any privacy controls. There were no laws on the books at that point. Right. It was all just what they felt like doing. And they wanted him to do a major study and figure out what was going on and then propose some laws sure. you know, to do something. Sure. And, they, and he said, I don't have the time to do it. Um, but he said, look, I have this woman who's about to graduate. Okay, if you allow her to co-direct this, she can do it, I'll supervise it. I'll, you know, the grand sure. plan will be mine and <laughs> don't right. worry. I mean, I won't let it go off the tracks, okay? But if you will do that, you know, then I'll agree to apply for this grant. And they said, okay. And they gave us $500,000 for three years, which in that time, in 71, that's a lot of money. of money, okay? So um, so I said, well then, he said, that'll give you three years to figure out what you can do. They'll give you three more years, times will change, different things will happen, you figure it all out for yourself, okay? And then you'll have this project also, so that'll be fine. So I did that for three years. And in the course of that three years, some of my professors have been saying, you should think about teaching. You should think about my, my supportive professors. They've been saying, you should think about teaching. And I said, you know, I know I love research. I know I love writing, but I don't know if I'd really like the classroom. I'm not sure, because I was still relatively shy <laughs> and whatever. And um, Arthur at that point was at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And we'd moved the grant to Harvard um, because, because he moved at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, all right, this is stupid. I'm just going to turn over my classes to you for two weeks. You're just going to teach my civil procedure class here at Harvard for two weeks and see if you like it. It'll be all on the joinder class action stuff because you know that, so don't worry. Um, but just do it. And I said, well, I don't, 
just do it. You're going to do this and you'll figure out. <laughs> and so I said, okay. Um, and I went in um, and I taught it and, and I fell in love with teaching. And it was in part it, in the beginning, what I did, which I think is very common for any beginning teacher, even though even in a more permanent setting, is you're so worried the students are going to think you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You're so worried that you're going to be unmasked for for all the things you don't know that you over prepare sure. ridiculously. Um, and so my thought was they really were going to be against me because this is Harvard. These are Harvard students. They paid their tuition, and they're getting this person who is two years out of law school. <laughs> who's teaching them this stuff. They're not going to be thrilled. So what I should do is, I will. I said to them, the first hour I'm just going to lecture to get you up to speed. And then we're going to pick up these cases and we're going to do, because I thought if I lectured at them for the first hour, they would understand I knew what I was talking about. Um, and I said, but don't worry, you can raise your hand and interrupt me. You can ask me questions along the way. I feel free to do that. And so I started off and I was doing my lecture and somebody raised their hand. And um, this is about 15 minutes into the hour. And so I called on them and they asked me a question. And because of my nervousness and, uh, you know, horror at, <laughs> at this, I said out loud what was in my mind, which was, oh my God, I know the answer to that. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> And at that point, the whole class just cracked up. I said, well, I do know the answer. The answer is X. And I calmed down, and they calmed down. And I mean, I had a great two weeks with, with them. Um, and so I said, OK, this is what I can do. You know, I can do this. And so that's what decided me to go into law teaching. OK, okay. interesting. <laughs> now, you were still doing this NSF Yes. Project. The deal with Arthur. <laughs> Arthur always engages in a tough bargain. When okay. the NSF thing was this because he was still doing the treatise, and I had been uh, I had been the head of his researchers my third year, okay? Mm -hmm. he, he always had one woman, and the rest were all guys, and the one woman was the head, because he said we were more mature than any of these guys, <laughs> and so he wanted the woman to kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, keep, right keep track of, exactly. So um, he, he basically, um, he said to me, well, I got this NSF grant. I said, okay, I want to do this. But Mary Kay, I'm moving to Harvard. This is going to be really complicated, uh, et cetera. I want you, I, the treatise is really like the long range thing, et cetera. So I will give, get you this essentially because it was his prestige. I had none. Sure. Uh, okay. But it means during the day you work on that, at night you work on the treatise and you supervise all these guys and the weekends, nice and weekends. So that's what I did. Um, I mean, so I. Your life was never your own. No, no, I never. No, no. All <laughs> nights and weekends was the treatise. Wow. The day was working on the NSF grant. <laughs> you know, so, um, so. So what came out of that? What are, what are you proud of with the NSF grant in terms of accomplishment? Oh, uh, the NSF grant. Well, I'm, I'm sort of sad, more than proud. Um, first of all, the reality is why I said I do this, I don't know, because I knew nothing about setting up a social science study and yeah. figuring it out, okay, so I had to learn all that, etc. Um, I learned enormous amount, it was very fascinating, I mean, I, the first year was setting it all up, the second year I went out and I, I interviewed people at RAND, at USC, at Columbia, oh, and whatever about their human subject research sure. and what they were doing, what controls they had, and then I spent the third year writing, and then, you know, with proposals. Sure. The thing is, the the problem is so. I mean, it was fascinating, and I, we had some good proposals because there were some bad stuff going on. Mm -hmm. But in the third year, having nothing to do with this project we were doing, all of a sudden Congress got very interested in the topic of privacy. They passed a series of laws. They passed all the laws with regard to privacy and education. Mm -hmm. You know about student sure. records and all that. That was all passed when I was writing this thing. They passed a whole series of laws about privacy, which meant that all the data that I'd collected was was then yeah, exactly <laughs> de defunct. I mean, the, there was going to be a new world out there, and who knew what was going to happen in the new world. So I finished writing, and we finished writing the, this book, but you couldn't sell it to anybody because it was a nice history right. <laughs> at the time when times had changed. So I learned a lot. It was very useful to me, but I can't say that um, that it did benefited anybody else <laughs> except myself, actually, my education. So uh, when you were, this project you were doing at night ended up being your life's work in terms exactly. of scholarship. Exactly, totally. 
treat it, the treatise yeah. is totally my, you know, yeah. that's the thing I'm most proud of in my, in my scholarship yeah. is the treat, treatise work. I'm now the primary author of 14 volumes of it and right. keep it up and work on it. So, <laughs> How did it come from one volume to 14? Uh, well, what it came from story. is, no, but no, it's, it's not that, I mean, look, working um, just on drafts with Arthur, with his students, et cetera, that's fine. Then when I went into law teaching and I was at SUNY at Buffalo, he said, well, would you be willing to take on the pocket parts mm -hmm. for some of these volumes? I'm mean, not talking about, you know, permanently taking on any of the volumes per se, mm -hmm. but just doing the pocket parts since you know what's there, since you were there kind of getting the, and I said, okay, so I took on a couple of the volumes to do the annual pocket parts for them. And then um, he, it, it, there came a point at which, you know, they were constantly turning out new volumes and the set was growing and there's there's only so much time in the, in the era. And so, um, he had, uh, and I will say this, I mean, Charlie Wright was also another Im amazing mentor to me later on after I got out of mm -hmm. law school. Um, Charlie, who was the senior author of the treatise, read every single thing that anybody published and sent comments. So Arthur, when he would finish a volume, would send it to Charlie Wright. Mm -hmm. And in those days, they didn't have email, they didn't have anything. Charlie Wright would send him back a 50-page hand-typed letter because he typed his own letters saying on page 127, on page, you know, I think this, I think this, whatever it was. And Arthur said to me, I can't tolerate reading these. They get me too upset. You just put the changes in unless you have a problem. I just don't want to see them, okay? So I got used to seeing, you know, seeing that. And so there came a point where a volume had to be revised, volume six, um, on rules 13 to 18. Um, and, um, and Arthur was already working on another volume and whatever. And so the publisher suggested to them that maybe since they knew I'd been working, you know, that maybe maybe I should just do the revision of that volume. And both of them said yes. Mm -hmm. So I took over that volume. Um, and, you know, and and I did well enough in doing that that then there was sort of more, I mean, as the thing grew, there, they sort of oh, just she morphed. Can do this one. Yeah, she could take this one on. <laughs> exactly, you know, and so it kind of, it kind of morphed. Um, and when I moved out to San Francisco and I was at Hastings, what Charlie would do then is, because um, he loves San Francisco, um, and so when, when I'd finish a volume, he would fly out and he'd spend two days with me. <laughs> he'd read the entire volume in two days, but then he could visit San Francisco and, and give me his comments. You know, yeah. So, um, so it, was, it was a really, uh, it was a good time. And, and the treatise, I mean, not only did it mean I really felt my competence across the field was really solid, right. um, but I was working with geniuses in the field who seemed to feel that they had confidence in me, mm -hmm. so that gave me confidence, right. you exactly. know, and it's an influential um, yeah. work. Right, how would you describe the influence of that, that multi-volume treatise? Um, I think in civil procedure, in, in, in civil litigation, let me put it that way, in civil litigation, um, it, it's probably right now the most influential thing. The courts, mm -hmm. I mean, use it all over. Moore's federal practice and the Wright, mm -hmm. uh, Wright and Miller's federal practice and procedure were the two things, but Moore's has decreased right. over time. Right. And so it's sort of the dominant one. There are some specialized ones on class actions, but in terms of a broad one, it's, yeah. it's the dominant one. It's and it's meant, it's meant I've gotten to know judges, it's meant I've gotten to know lawyers, and that's really important because I think the worst thing, particularly in my field, that you can do is become an academic that's just sheltered and don't know what the real problems are and what people are really dealing with. Right. And so it's allowed me to have a lot of access and have people come to me with problems and questions and so to be part of the real living process as litigation, you know, it, it because of that I got put on the standing committee for the judicial conference. Okay. I mean, you know, to really be involved in rulemaking. That's what you were doing in the judicial conference Yes, primarily. yes, yeah. yes. Um, and so, uh, actually, the sad thing I was really doing there is it was the year they started and they put me as one of the three-person subcommittee to restyle all the civil rules of procedure. <laughs> for three years, that's all we did was restyle the entire set of the rules of procedure. So I know every rule at this point. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was... Um, um, so it, it really, the, the treatise has been um, the focal point of my, my identity mm -hmm. uh, as a scholar sure. within the profession. Sure. And it's interesting because I know in, in, in academics, um, scholarship has, has gotten much more broad than it was when I was in law school, sure. Lord knows. 
And indeed, the kind of stuff that we do in the treatise is not as, as highly regarded among some academics as being scholarship. Right. <laughs> it's viewed as too practical. Right. <laughs> too, too practical, sure. you know, too pointed to... I think that's supposed. coming back. <laughs> think. Yeah, I think it is coming back. But, you know, those things come around and go around, you know. And so, at the same time, um, for me, it has enormous potential for impact and help helping people kind of work through things. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been, um, um, I view it as, as a high point of my scholarship. Let's go back to your early teaching days yep. at Buffalo. Yep. How were you received as a law teacher there? Well, in, it, very well and easily, and I'll say mm -hmm. that I was very fortunate. Given again, at that point we're talking 1974, Buffalo had four women law teachers before I joined the faculty. There were only 36 people on the faculty. It was a unique school right. for that. Most schools didn't have any. A few had one. Right. Okay. And what I know is that for most women in those situations, I mean, the school had decided they had to have women faculty because the students were demanding it, whatever society was demanding it. So that meant that poor woman, not only did she do what every other faculty member did, but she got put on every committee known to man or right. woman. Um, because they wanted a woman representative on a it. Voice, yeah. I mean, a voice, okay? And the students, the women students, were in her office all the time because that was the one person they saw that they had gender identity with, sure. okay? Whereas I went to a school where there were four other women before I joined. Um, and I didn't have to, also, I know a number of women who, um, my field was civil procedure. They wanted me because they needed civil procedure, actually. They had a hole. <laughs> and so they, they wanted me. They didn't ask me to teach, you know, um, any kind of gender courses. Whereas a lot of women, while that wasn't their their interest of writing, nonetheless, it was thought you've got to, sure. te you've got to do sex discrimination. Right. <laughs> you you got to women in law because none of the men could do it, right. and so you got to pick it up. And so I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate. Right. I didn't find, I mean, the women were already accepted on the faculty. It were was they accepted by the students too? Yeah. Um, they, yes, they were actually. I mean, it wasn't, it really was not an issue. I mean, so I was in sort of a unique environment given the time in, in terms of, I mean, you know, there'd be one or two students, but you're, I mean, no, generally they were used to them. So they didn't, you know, they didn't, um, they didn't really cause um, any kind of difficulty mm -hmm. for climbing. I mean, I saw when I was out at Hastings even, and, and I was the first woman law professor at Hastings. Okay, okay but later on when we had a lot more women there were still guys that would give the younger women a lot of grief, younger women faculty. I was senior at that point, so they didn't give me grief. But, um, you know, but I was just, uh, Buffalo was um, a very easy environment mm -hmm. um, to, to ease into law teaching, and I was just very fortunate to have done, uh, gotten the position there. So where, why, did you, why did you go on from there? Um, well, the reality is um, that the person who ultimately became my husband, um, I had met him when I was at Harvard okay. doing this research study with Arthur Miller. He was a visiting professor from Berkeley. Okay. Law, law, law professor, okay, okay. from okay. Bolt. Okay, uh, from Berkeley. And okay. so um, we had kept in contact and we had been carrying on this long distance, yes. to say the least, relationship, okay? Um, and I got this opportunity to visit at Hastings uh, in the spring of 76. And so I said, well, that's that makes sense. Yeah. I will go and see what happens. Sure, sure. <laughs> and so that sort of, you know. It happened. Yeah. It happened. It happened. Exactly. Exactly. Well, tell us a little bit more about your married life and, and how that's made a difference for you. Well, it made a difference for me, not in the usual ways. That you, I have no, we had no children. Mm -hmm. um, and he is deceased. Okay. Uh, he died in 87, so he's been dead a long time yeah. now. All right. Uh, we were together for 10 years. Um, and, you know, we. he was also in my field. And it was like, we lived and breathed civil procedure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we kind of, um, uh, we talked about, it. he really, he was older than I, and he really wanted me to succeed. I mean, I think if we had been at the same age, there could have been a competitiveness sure. in each of us. There could have been also, but they weren't, it wasn't there. I mean, I had somebody who was like, you must do more, you know. Yeah. So he was at the point on the weekends, while I'd sit at the dining room table and I was working on my scholarship, he was out working on woodworking okay. <laughs> on the deck because I mean, he could be there at right. that point, you know, yeah. and so, and that's all right, you know, right. we were together. Uh, right. um, he, um, he loved to cook and I loved to cook and so we did a lot of entertaining. We just enjoyed doing that. Uh, we, we took 
two weeks vacation every year and we went somewhere. Um, so we explored different places, which was great, great fun. <laughs> you know, and uh, so, it, you know, he really, he gave me confidence that I don't know that I ever would have totally had, mm -hmm. you, know, nice. um, um, you know, uh, without him. And, uh, and so he, uh, he was um, most, most supportive of everything, um, uh, everything that I did, um, actually. And so, you know, that was, that was always good. The, the thing, uh, a funny story that I remember is we um, had gone to um, Grand Teton uh, National Park. Yeah. It was one of our trips. Um, and neither one of us were great. We didn't camp. I mean, we stayed in the cabins. <laughs> but, but we had heard that there was this thing. You could take a boat across, and you could t walk about a mile up to this waterfall, and a ranger would lead you up. And mm -hmm. the boat came every hour to take you back or something like that. And we said, okay, we'll do that. So we went. And we're walking from the boat to the waterfall, and the ranger is telling the group of us that are there, you know, we've had a lot of bear sightings. There's a whole lot of bear sightings, so I hope you've got your bear bells on. And we're like, what are you talking about, bear bells? I've never heard of bear bell. Um, a parent, and the, she explained, and a lot of people did have these stupid bells <laughs> tied up to their shoes, that she said, bears don't really, they're, they're not trying to be hostile. So you need a lot, to make a lot of noise so that then the, they hear you coming and then they'll disappear. You don't want to come up on them and scare them right. or otherwise you can have a bad experience. So she said, so if you don't have it, just talk loudly, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, just you know, make sure they know you're coming. So uh, <laughs> so you know, we went up to the waterfall and there was, with the group of us, there's a lot of noise. You know, okay, that's fine. And people peeled off at different points and we were ready to go back and we were by ourselves walking back to the where the boat was supposed to pick us up. And I said, okay, we gotta start talking. We gotta start talking loudly. I mean, we just have to be shouting so no bears go. <laughs> and so he was then working on an article on, believe it or not, but on federalized race judicata. And so here are the two of us out in this beautiful thing and we're shouting at each other about federalized race judicata and its different implications historically, blah, blah, blah. And I said, if any of our students could see us here, this would be a real disaster, a total disaster. <laughs> That's but that's Sorry. so we were we were uh, a good team, yeah, really. <laughs> and we had no bears. No, no bear bears. came near us talking about federalized race to <laughs> Probably better than a bill. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. So, so uh, after you were at Hastings for as a visitor, they decided to hire you on. Yeah. What well, the, and they had a they had a, a practice then, um, which has some sense today. It would be impractical. Mm -hmm. It was like. They would not make a decision while anybody was on site. Oh, okay. Okay. So I went back to Buffalo oh, for a year, and yeah. then they made me an offer the following fall. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then I came back in '77. Yeah. So when you were at Hastings, you were pretty much teaching some pro and related classes. And conflicts and remedies mm -hmm. and class action seminar. Sure. It's all yeah. pro related. And were there other things that you did as a law professor or be beyond the classroom? And well, you were working on these books. <laughs> Multiple books, and at some point you were, you were working on the nutshell and some substance. Yes, I did the nutshell my first year in teaching. You did? I did. Wow. Yeah, the, the, the publisher wanted it because they knew me and they thought I'd get it done. Um, and so I said, well, you know, I'll do it every class when I come back. I'll kind of write out or type out um, sort of like a precy of sort of what I was trying to get across. Sure. And then in the summer, I'll put these all together mm -hmm. and fill in the gaps, etc. So I did it. <laughs> <laughs> my first year of law teaching. And I'll tell you a funny thing about the nutshell. The nutshell, which is not scholarship, I mean, I, I accept that. It was yeah. for students. It's for yeah, first year students, trying to give them the forest instead sure, of the trees, sure. right? Um, and so uh, I did it with that in mind. So while some of my colleagues were sort of like in horror that I, I mean, you know, yeah. uh, the nutshell, you know, why should you put it on your resume, right? <laughs> it turns out I've now done a lot of international travel for one thing or another that. It's been translated into several languages. Really? And so in Japan and in China, I've been introduced to this. is the author of the nutshell. This is the, they don't know the treatise, the treatise, they don't care. That's way more than they need to know. But I am, I am famed in Korea, in China, in Japan because of my nutshell. There you go. Because that's the way they figured out American civil procedure, that's or at least got good. an idea. Sure. So you never know. That's great. Yeah. So, yeah. So most of the time you were in right. Baldwin Scholarship. Yeah, and, and yeah. working with students, I mean, I didn't have other community interests. I mean, I was mm -hmm. uh, I was doing things with my husband. I was sure. working on my scholarship and teaching and sure. working with my students, and that was it. 
or so at some point though you decided to go into administration um not exactly um <laughs> I, the, or someone you know, decided sorry, for yes you yeah for i mean and i think i think I mean, if you think about it, when I think back on it now, I mean, my whole career has been, it's not like I set out with a goal. Right. It's sort of like I kind of, at a certain point in your life, this becomes, i got to make a decision. Well, um, we'd gone through a lot of difficult times at Hastings at that point, a variety of them. Um, and I had been on chair of several committees, et cetera, and at different times as a faculty member, I had complained about, my heavens, I don't see why we couldn't do X or why we couldn't do Y and whatever. And so... We were going to a dean change um, in a, um, a uh, precipitous one. Um, and they said to me, would you, you know, Mary Kay, you've been talking all this time about, we could do this. We, why don't you just step up the plate and do it? <laughs> you know, my, some of my colleagues. Yeah. Um, and so I threw my hat in the ring and we did a national search and we had outside candidates and, um, as well as myself, but then they offered me um, the deanship. So um, I became um, the dean in 2000 and, um, Oh, 2000, uh, 1993. <laughs> Long time in 1993. Right. I'd been the academic dean, which is the number two person, right. um, from ni from 90 to 93. So you were associate dean while while you were in the dean search. Did yes. that cause any problems? Well, it slightly it it did. I mean, the problem was that the dean um, took a golden handshake and he left in October, mm -hmm. and we were we'd started the dean search. We knew he was going to, okay. but we started the dean search, and so. I said, I can't, you can't name me interim dean or it's going to scare, I mean, then yeah. that becomes too hard, right? And so I said, it doesn't matter, under our bylaws, as the number two person, I have all the authority without having to have my title changed. Right. So you were the dean, essentially. I was the dean for the yeah. few months while they sure. completed it, you know, and then I just tried to keep my head down. Sure. <laughs> so what surprised you about being a dean, anything? Or were you pretty much ready for it? Um, I was... Because I've been academic dean, in terms of the problems that were ahead of us, I was ready. I mean, I knew what the issues were. I knew where you know what needed to be addressed. Sure. The thing that surprised me um, the most probably were personnel things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I found them. I mean, colleagues that I'd had for years and years that I thought I could rely on were not reliable from my point of view. <laughs> um, it, not in terms of how do you vote on something, but on getting something done and sort of, you know, making the commitment. And I guess I've learned through the years that, um, and I, I don't, this is, just, this is the nature of the beast. I don't think it's a, a good or a bad. I mean, I wish it were different as a dean, but um, that most faculty, by numbers, are not into institution building. Right. They're just not, they don't think that way. They're, they don't say, oh, I mean, they're loyal to the institution, and they care about that. But in terms of investing uh, thought, energy, and whatever, they're not into that aspect of it. And I was idealistic, and I don't think I really saw that coming in. I thought there'd be more um, true support in the sense of not just voting in terms of initiatives we wanted, but actually the sweat and tears sure. that go into making certain things happen. But, you know, you, you, you learn. learn. <laughs> you know, you learn, you know. And so that was probably the, um, the hardest thing. The other thing is, and this is somewhat peculiar to Hastings. Um, Hastings, which is part of UC, is an affiliate of UC. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is we're a freestanding campus. We do not report to the Board of Regents. We had a separate and independent Board of Directors appointed by the governor, 12 of them. Okay, and so I reported to a separate and independent Board of Directors. The budget comes from the state legislature, not from UC. Okay. So I had to go to the legislature and I had to get our budget through every year. Um, you know, we had to do all these projects and, and things. So there were things being a freestanding campus that meant there were responsibilities I'd never done before sure. that I had to learn quickly. I mean, I knew our budgets because I'd been academic dean, so I just had to get more of them under my belt. But um, during my deanship, um, we totally renovated three buildings, built another one, and the result was I had to learn about the whole EIR process, I had to learn about politics, and how one dealt with politics in a city that is rife with politics. Um, you know, and so it was a good time in my life, though, to take that on because um, I, uh, well, two different things. My husband had dis was deceased by then. Mm -hmm. I would not have done that were he were alive because I wouldn't have invested the amount of energy and time that I had to. Um, but it was also, it was a good time to learn new things. 
it was good to have challenges, right. not to just be sort of doing the repetitive things that sure. I like doing, but you know, why not challenge yourself to do that? And I, I really feel that that's what makes law really great, is that it, it can morph, it can change, that you can do new things with it, right. that it gives you such an opportunity. And, um, and so I, I really enjoyed the opportunity um, to learn new things and to help the school that I love um, kind of develop in new ways that, um, that otherwise it might not have. So what, do you, what, what would you say your biggest legacy is as the dean? And as Chancellor? the dean? Well, um, or many of them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I think there were three things, okay? Yeah. One, when I first became dean, we were just changing. Um, our national history, and we'd been around since 1878, but our national history came after World War II when the then dean, Snodgrass, started the 65 Club, which was this famous saying uh, everybody had to retire at age 65 at that time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the giants in the legal teaching world didn't want to retire, sure. but their university couldn't keep them on. So he got permission from the legislature and he hired them. So our faculty was Prosser and, and Perkins and Trainer and mm -hmm. just all these people who sure. were giants in their field. And that's what put us on the map nationally is having mm -hmm. these giants. When I joined the faculty in 19th, they were just trying to morph into a more balanced faculty. 70% mm -hmm. of the faculty were all 65 club members. Mm -hmm. I was a sole woman, okay? Oh, wow. um, and so, I mean, but then by 93, the changes in age discrimination laws meant that schools didn't, could not yeah. force people to retire. Right. And they didn't necessarily want to move if they were totally happy their grandchildren were there. I mean, you know, okay, so they stayed where they were. So that made recruiting that much harder. Right. It also, uh, the reason we were able financially to do uh, that was such a dominant fact. We, we paid them uh, our top salary, which was a very top salary at the time. Right. They had no sabbaticals. Mm -hmm. They had no research assistance. They had none of the support that faculty need sure. if they're growing and developing faculty. Well, that would be viewed as age discrimination, not to give them all those things. And so they were, we didn't have to pay into a retirement system for them. They were getting yeah. retirement sure. from their home school plus Social Security, sure. <laughs> you know, whatever we had to start putting in for retirement. I mean, it changed the whole cost dynamic. Yeah. And so we had to figure out a way to, to keep the tradition of having a, a significant senior faculty and attracting some people as well as promoting some from within, um, without, uh, within the various constraints that then existed. And so that was my transition. My first thing was trying to deal with the faculty, which we were able to do. It was the first time we'd never even, we had never even asked for money for chairs. Mm. <laughs> Or things so big fundraising. Yeah, you had to get a chair. Right. Yeah, big fundraising to get stuff so that we could do that. Um, so that that I would say was certainly a significant um, transition and important thing to put us into the modern era. Um, the second was the campus. Um, the The key is when I first came to Hastings, we were a commuter school basically. Um, one of my predecessors actually got us some housing that we converted, uh, which we now have two hundred fifty apartments in that that are a block away. Um, but also, it still it didn't have things going on. It didn't have conferences. It mm. didn't have things going on that would draw people to us. Sure. Okay, so it was creating programs and get, getting. I mean, I didn't create them all. I couldn't. There's not enough hours in the day. But right. getting your colleagues, saying, I will support this if you go out and get me. Right. I mean, I had great colleagues who, and, and that they were great at. Mm -hmm. They can come up with ideas for programs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no question about that. Okay, and then you know, figuring out how to you know get people to come to them, etc. And reaching out to our alumni who had been sort of, um, we never even asked for money until 1972. Mm -hmm. uh, so like 100 years into our history before we ever asked for money because right. uh, the state was declining in their right, support. Sure. Um, and so getting out there and getting them kind of organized, you know, into that. But creating a campus, creating things going on in a campus, I think, you know, was, um, and then building the campus and redoing yeah. it, yeah, to, to make it welcoming. Yeah. Um, so those are, that's sort of the way I, I see that. And I, I will say to you that one of the most overwhelming and uh, uh, emotional um, things that happened to me is, because so I did that for 13 years and I worked on all these various projects and I got very close to a number of alumni, et cetera. One of the last projects that I did, I, I was doing two simultaneously. One was totally revamping our library faculty office building. Mm -hmm. The other was I was building a garage, um, and which politically was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I was having that done. But anyway, we were doing that, and I was stepping. I, I had told them I would stay on 
when my renewal was up for another five years, I said, I don't want to do another five years, but we were in the process of trying to get the approvals for the garage, and I said, I will stay three. If you don't get the approvals in three, you're not going to get in 30. Um, and, you know, that's over. And then somebody else can build it. I don't need to build it. I'll just get it through all the political processes. Okay, so I did. But we finished the building, the library faculty building that we'd been doing um, in that period. Mm -hmm. And I'd done a lot of fundraising for it. And, and as you know, in fundraising, it's naming opportunities, yes. right? Name this, name that, <laughs> whatever. And so there were three alums of mine. Um, uh, who said, okay, they would come together and made sort of this joint major gift and they had naming rights for the building subject to the board's approval. Um, you know, and, and it was always interesting. So what were they going to do with this? You know, okay, I could see the three names. I mean, right. say, how are they going to they they negotiate this? Them. You know, these are three powerful men. <laughs> it will be very interesting, okay? So they had a retirement dinner for me when I was uh, retiring. And the surprise was they had gone to the board behind my back and they named the building after me. Oh. And so, I mean, it says so much about the, my alumni and how incredibly generous, how incredibly generous they are. Right. They said, no, 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 you put the stamp on the campus. It should be your building. Right. So, so, I mean, um, the place has been family to me. Yeah. It has been truly, truly family. Other than the sort of issue of stepping up frustrations. Frustrations? Yeah, over oh, your man. Career. Oh, frustrations were um, not being able to do things as quickly as I wanted them done. I mean, uh, not scholarship-wise, I was fine, but uh, administration, mostly in administration, you know, sort of realizing, okay, oh, if we could do this so much, how much you benefit, and so you can't get it done, <laughs> you know, because you have to go through the variety of hoops you have to go through. Um, I found that I did not enjoy at all dealing with the legislature. Um, the, the key for me in the legislature was um, because in general they treated us like UC. If UC got a 3% increase, we got a 3% mm -hmm. increase. If we, had, I mean, realistically, they didn't do, uh, except with one caveat I'll give you, but the, they didn't really do that much differently. But the key was if you weren't up there and they didn't know who you were, somebody said, oh, I need some more money. Who's this Hastings? And they'll just mm -hmm. take you out of the budget. So you had to kind of be present to protect yourself. And so, in politics, I don't like in any event. So, it, you know, that was it. The only thing that was really good is we went separately, and I did. I got I got us written into two bond measures um, that basically, you know, paid for the infrastructure parts of two of our building renovations, mm -hmm. and then the rest was alumni, you know, <laughs> doing it. So, but I, I hate it. I mean, it was just like oh, I mean, that was just frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, you know. It, and see, all those are people things, aren't they? Sure. When you get down to it, they're all they're all people things. Um, you know, I don't know that I'd say anything anything else that obviously comes to mind. I mean, I wish I could have gotten some things done that I didn't get done, <laughs> but that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in this time, you also were taking leadership roles outside, like. Mm -hmm. The ALS president. Mm -hmm. How did how did those happen? Um, a variety. First of all, I've always believed in kind of being involved in in organizations that have to do with the things that I know something about, so I can contribute to them. Right. So ALS, it first started through sections. I mean, I was in civil procedure section. I was in the conflict section. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, whatever. And in the early nineties, I because I, I was on the executive committee twice. I was put on the executive committee earlier on. Um, and I was there for three years, which I enjoyed enormously. I don't know how I got somebody nominated me. I have no idea who nominated me, so I am not really sure. Um, I was asked, it was just as I became dean at Hastings, if I would throw my hat in the ring t to be nominated for president. And I said no, because my thought was, I'm just, I said, it's my first year as dean at Hastings. I've got to give my total devotion to Hastings. Sure. This is a new thing. I can't have split loyalties. <laughs> And so I said, no one figured they'd never come back to me. I mean, you know, it's, well, it's one of those things. Right. There's time and, oh, and whatever, right. okay. Um, but I just felt I owed it to Hastings. Um, and so I was surprised when they did come back to me <laughs> and say, you know, somebody wants to nominate you. Would you let them nominate you? <laughs> um, and at that point, um, I mean, I'd been dean for seven years, so I was, <laughs> I was, yeah. I kind of knew what I was doing and how to manage, you know, what what it was. And so I said yes, and so it, it worked out. So, so in your, your year as president, any highs, any lows, any? Um, actually, 
actually, I had a number of, I was very happy. I, my year was focused on teaching and scholarship. That was sort of what I wanted to, to get into. And so, um, it, I'm not sure what they're doing now, but at that time, the president got to arrange one conference that was sort of what the, I mean, freestanding conference that the president was interested in. Sure. And I said, we've been doing all these new teachers' conferences. I really think we should have an experienced teacher's mm -hmm. conference. There's lots going on outside of legal education about learning, about how you put this in. And most law teachers know nothing about it. I don't know mo most about it. And so that's what we did. And we had this, we had it in Canada. And it was, it was a great conference. It was, I learned so much at that conference. Yeah. And so I really, that was like a, a high point, you know, a, a high point of it. I also broke down at the annual meeting. At that time, there was one plenary. That just sort of, you know, it, it was yeah. like, no, let's have three different ones going on because people have different interests. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is if you're not interested in the one plenary, you don't go. Right. <laughs> and you lose a huge audience. And so, you know, again, since it was teaching and learning, we can do three different things, <laughs> you know, and, and pull it off. Um, and so, um, you know, I, w I was most pleased actually with the, you know, you know, with those things. I don't really remember, there probably were, but I honestly don't remember any crisis issues mm -hmm. the year I was president. There probably were some, but they were minor enough that right. they have not stuck in my memory. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the only thing I will say is at the end of that annual meeting, I was like, I don't know if I ever want to go to a meeting again in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really enjoy that meeting because I was sort of like, go over here and introduce so-and-so. Go over here and introduce so-and-so. It was not actually the best meeting that I've ever gone to for any less. <laughs> but that's the reality of that's it, reality. you know. <laughs> yeah, and so so I've always enjoyed um, my, my, uh, my various ventures with the ALS. Mm -hmm. And then I was fortunate enough to go on the ABA Council for six years, mm -hmm. so I did a six-year term there. And that's in part because I've, uh, many years ago, they asked me to start doing accreditation site visits, and I've chaired so many site teams mm -hmm. well, you know, over 20 years, I can't even say. Um, and so anyway, they put me on that. And that was interesting because it was so different from the ALS. I mean, ALS is all law teachers or right. deans, but they're all law teachers, or law faculty of one sort or another. Whereas that's got the public members, right. it's got you know the judges, it's got the bar examiners, and the way they see things is sometimes really very different. I mean, it's not an easy group because they come at it from such different ways, right. and you know, so that was it was fascinating because it was just very different. It, it it was just very different in terms of the group that you're dealing with, um, and so I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that. Um, and then I've been on the Council of the American Law Institute. Right. I was um, going to ask yeah. about that. How yeah. did that happen? I love that. Um, well, in, in 1990, I was appointed to be co-reporter with Arthur Miller for the Complex Litigation Project for the ALI, um, which was one of the most exciting things I ever did. Um, largely because, again, the ALI has got a third judges, a third lawyers, and a third academics. So your work is being subjected to people who are really in the field, right. who can really look at it and say, this doesn't work, right. and you're trying to do something practical for them, and I loved um, doing that. So my feeling was it was a success if nobody stood up when they were supposed to be in the general meeting evaluating and said, you're an idiot, you left something out. <laughs> I mean, they could say, this is wrong. As long as they dis we can disagree, sure. and we can talk about it, but just don't say, I omitted something. <laughs> this is not the first year teacher, isn't it? Sure. I, don't, sure. I want to be on sure. top of things, right? And nobody did, so I survived that, and I, it was a really good experience, and I enjoyed it. And apparently, um, through it, the nominating committee, which is a committee of the council, decides who they want to nominate, and so, you know, for whatever reason, they decided not right that they thought that I'd be a good add-on to the council, yeah. and they nominated me. Um, and um, so I became a member of the council. And I will, it, when I originally joined them, there were no term limits. Mm -hmm. They were till you were there for life as right. long as you wanted to be. Okay. And then we did a total revamp under my trainer's um, presidency of. Uh, term limit, because we wanted to make sure we had new blood, I mean, sure. um, coming in. The council is a unique body in the sense that it's really a substantive body because it really, it has to, it's a bicameral situation in which in order to have anything adopted as an ALI document, the council has to vote on it and say yes, and the full house has to vote on it. And so we have to read everything that comes through, and we have debate it, and we have separate meetings on it. Um, and so you have a responsibility. It, one of the things I love about it, it forces me out of my comfort zone. I have to read all these things about areas that I'm not, you know, into. But the idea is a generalist should be able to read this and say, 
wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Right. Is it really the way this is? And sometimes right. it is, right. but sometimes it's not. Sometimes, you know, and so um, I really have enjoyed that, um, that work mm -hmm. um, enormously. I will go off the council in two years, or go emeritus, um, but they've been very good um, in, when we adopted the system. I was part of the people who adopted it, so I can't say they. We have been very good um, because we have felt we have benefited so much from our most senior people because they come to every meeting, mm -hmm. they're prepared, and they know the law that they practice. I mean, right. they, they really participate in a really serious way that emeriti um, are encouraged to come to every meeting. Mean, okay. While they're private meetings, because we're a private group, so you, the public doesn't come, emeriti do, and they still come. Some of the giants still fly in for the meetings, mm -hmm. still prepared. <laughs> they can't vote, emeritus, right. they have no vote. But most things are done by consensus in any event. They're not done by, I mean, every now and then we have something tough and it's a divided vote, but most things are done by just the comments and it was, it's a good idea and, you know, we move on from there. So that's been intellectually a broadening experience. Mm -hmm. It's allowed me to meet and become friends with. Um, a number of people that I otherwise would not have because they're not in law teaching, <laughs> you know, they're in practice, they're, they're judges. Um, and it's just been most, um, it's been most rewarding. I used to say when I was dean, it was the thing that kept me going because your colleagues don't treat you like you have a brain after you're dean. You know, <laughs> I'm the one they want to say, are you going to defrost the faculty refrigerator? Yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't talk to you about civil procedure things. Right. They don't. I mean, they sort of like, no. It's just, can you fix this? Can you take care of that problem? And so this was the group that was like, no. All our conversations were about law, <laughs> so was, they were great. So that that's been really very good. And your new venture with the International Association. Yes, the International Association of Law Schools has been um, a marvelous venture um, for me because what we're focused on at this point is the improvement of legal education globally. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, in part, the reason I got involved late, I mean, ironically, I was president of the ALS when the ILS, they were first having the meetings to decide whether there should be an ILS, oh. believe it or not. Uh, I went over as president to the meeting that was in Italy. I'm just like, <laughs> a weird thing, but that I wasn't involved after I was president. You sure. know, things went on their own. Um, through the ABA work that I did and all the accreditation work I did, I was asked through ABA Roley, I went to, um, I was asked to help law schools in Bahrain and in um, Qatar to help them improve their curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so I went over and spent some time working with them about ways um, that, that they could improve what they were doing sure. um, in various ways. Um, and so then from that, and because odd things. I, I'd written a report, one of the last things I did when I was on the ABA Council was a report that they'd asked me to chair a committee on, um, which had to do with internationalism and, and the ABA and accreditation and whether they should accredit outside. And sure. We had this committee and we wrote this report that got totally tanked. Um, <laughs> uh, so I was not going to what the report was, but it got known as the Kane Report. Mm. Um, and in it, we had said, we thought under these sets of circumstances, you know, you could so obviously those of us on the committee were much more international than the sure, council was sure, that sure. were in town, let's put it that way. And as a result, I got identified as friendly <laughs> in the international <laughs> sphere. <laughs> and so then I was asked um, to uh, actually come because a lot of the, uh, a, lot, a number of uh, internationalists, when they saw what the ABA council did, thought this is America just slamming the door to, and they were very offended. So I was asked if I go to some meetings and just talk so they could see their, you know, no, I mean, and I wasn't, I understood why the council did what it did. It's one of those things, you know, but I could just talk more calmly and they could see we're, we weren't all against them. Mm -hmm. And then out of that, I got asked to be, you know, on their board. And from that, what we've been doing um, has really uh, interested me. Um, and I, so I've been able to to go to places that I would not otherwise have been, and yeah. then law schools have asked me because they know me, you know, sure. from that. So, um, so I've been um, in Colombia, uh, and I've been in Chile, and I've been in Estonia, <laughs> and uh, you know, all over. And so, I've, I've, my knowledge about legal education, and programming, and how you set things up, and recognizing that a lot of things we do here are totally irrelevant in the international. Right. I mean, you know, I'm not going to talk to them about they should have tenured law professors. 
I mean, that they most of them are part time. They don't sure. have the money. Right. <laughs> At least when you start talking South America right. <laughs> and the like. And so I'm not trying to turn them into American law schools. Sure. I'm trying to help them improve what they're doing mm -hmm. and understand if they want some of their graduates to have any kind of possibility of you know getting into a global arena. Right. Then they have to have certain things that are available to them. Wow. And anything in particular that you think. Uh, a, those schools need to be doing, and secondly, American schools need to be doing based on what you've learned. Well, in terms of what those schools need to be doing, a um, couple things. One, they need to do a lot more writing. Mm -hmm. They do not do writing at all. And as I've said to them time, I said, they don't have legal writing and research courses. Sure. <laughs> and they, don't, they have an exam, and the exam is rote memorization. Mm -hmm. So they don't have problem solving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, they don't have the opportunity. And I said, you know, for, if you want your students, uh, and, and the ones who are in the Middle East, they wanted their students to stay in the Middle East, They wanted, but they wanted the international firms to hire their students sure. there in the Middle East, because they could speak Arabic. They, I mean, they'd be perfect, except they didn't have the skills. Right. <laughs> and so you need, you need to teach them analysis. You need to teach problems. <laughs> you know, you need, uh, so it's really, that those were the things that were really lacking heavily. It's not a course in something. Sure. Um, but it, it's more um, the building. approach to it, exactly, and, and not just having these dry lectures in the, right. the old-fashioned form, right? Um, uh, in terms of what America, uh, American law schools could do uh, for global for global things, I actually think we have a lot of good international things going on. I mean, not all schools have to be it. I mean, it can vary from school to school, but there's enough opportunity that people interested in it, I think, can, can probably can probably get it. I mean, I, I mean, I think we're pretty much out there. Right. Um, so I don't think there's any advice um, I would give to American schools about what they need to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, the the weird thing is the whole LLM situation, um, in the sense of the LLMs wanting to come here so they can get license so that then they can do it. And, and that bothers me some. I mean, one year is not, I mean, you may pass the bar if you're really smart and you take a good bar review course and you've had one year, but that does not mean I'd really want you as my lawyer. But that's not, your, it's not our choice. That's the different states make those choices. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So looking back over your career, how, what, what, what are the highlights of what's changed in legal education? Well, for one thing, it's much more diverse yeah. in all sorts of ways. I mean, right. and not just women, but also minorities. It's right. much more. And uh, I mean, you know, um, and I think, therefore, in becoming diverse, people don't think about it anymore right. as much. I mean, so, um, I mean, when I was dean, it was like, oh, my God, the first woman dean. I mean, this is like, I mean, and, and when I was dean, there were about 193 accredited law schools, and there were 11 women deans. Mm -hmm. I mean, now people just don't think, it's like, okay, it happens to be a woman sure. this time who's dean. <laughs> you know, and so that's good because you don't have that baggage right. um, to deal with, um, and you can deal with the problems that you, and the challenges that that you have. Um, I think though that I think it's much tougher for teachers now, and I don't think they've really gotten used to it. Students today who are brought up with technology being what it is, technology has changed dramatically. So many things that that we do, um, and to the good on many things, but on some things it it means you have a generation that's like instantaneous information. I want instantaneous information as opposed to thoughtful, kind of I want to sit and think about this and analyze it on my own and get to an end. I just want the end answer. Um, and they think they can get it by going on Google. Mm -hmm. And that's their, I think to being a good lawyer, the, those are shortcuts you cannot right. <laughs> use. And so that concerns me in terms of, and how do you teach people that there's a value to doing it the slow way? Yeah. That's that to me is a huge challenge, um, and um, one that's going to go on for quite some time. Um, you know, I think about it. I I also think that um, that this time when the you know when the job market tanked, um, and then all the law schools scrambling around is also this enormous problem. I mean, we had uh, recessions before in California. I lived through two of them as dean, um, and they were bad. But there, this is. This is different. It's the profession is changing. What they want in their lawyers is changing. Uh, you know, uh, and they they don't want as many of them. They'll outsource. I mean, they're down to the bottom line mm -hmm. on everything. And so, um, you know, I think that puts a lot more pressure on the young people with their debt load. I worry about that enormously, um, and because that just wasn't we didn't think about that 
you know, you you had a good job if you and we right. didn't have we didn't have the tuition that now exists, you know. And so, um, I think these are very difficult times for legal education. I mean, I think we'll come through them, um, but um, you know, the, there will be waste and and there will be harm done along the way because that's what happens when you come through these periods. So I've seen that change, and that's not to the good. <laughs> Uh, technology on the other side is to the good. I mean, it offers opportunities right. that we never had before. Right. And I think that's that's all to the good, you know, in terms of that. What would you say to a woman coming into legal education as a teacher now? As a teacher? Well, I'd say, um, you know, I think, I think the world can be your oyster if you want it to be. As a teacher, I think it really can be. I don't know that I'd say that in law practice necessarily, mm -hmm. but as a teacher, mm -hmm. I would say uh, you. And I, but the key is, figure out what you believe in, what you want. You know, you don't have to be. You don't have to be nasty about it. You don't have to be pushy about it. But figure out what, what's important to you, and then just sort of go forward and invest your time and your energy in it because you will be respected if you. I mean, the key to me is I never had a goal that said oh, I want to be at X place, or oh, by age X, I have to have achieved this, or whatever. It was, you know, I want to be respected in what I do. I want my students to, you know, to, to respect. I want them to think I'm a really good teacher. I put a lot of effort into it. I want the people in my field to think that I, I deserve to be in their field right. and that they pay some attention when I say something, okay? Um, and don't worry if the whole world doesn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. Don't worry that you have some naysayers and people who say, no, you're not, you know, don't. If you feel that's your core and that's where you're at and you work at it, then trust that it'll come, it'll work. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you'll hit roadblocks along the way, but don't give up. Just kind of go forward. Because I think the potential is there because there are a lot of barriers that are not there now. Okay. I mean, you, you don't have to prove to be the woman on your law faculty. <laughs> You know, and now that there are more women, you don't have all the burdens either. Right. The burdens are shared, <laughs> as it were. I mean, as they as they are amongst the men for other sure. reasons. I mean, uh, so the burdens are spread right. in a way. And you have the pension. If you want to go into administration, you have the potential of doing that if that's what you want to do. Right. Whereas before, I mean, nobody would have thought about it very much. Right. <laughs> um, you know, and so you you simply have to figure out for yourself. You know, and you don't need to know on day one, as I did not. That's the other thing I would say. You don't need to have a plan that you're following. In fact, you're probably better off not having a plan that you're following because then you get depressed if you don't reach right. certain things all, all the way along the way. Instead, you know, um, have a general goal of what you'd like to think about yourself at the right. end. Right. And see how life offers you opportunities, mm -hmm. as I've been very fortunate to have. Right. Now, have I missed some things that you would like people to know in these? No, you've come from a lot. generations. From generations, yeah, it is generations, <laughs> isn't it? Um, no, I don't think so. I think okay. you've covered you've covered everything. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this interview. Okay, I'm sure, well, thank it's going to make Marie. a difference for women coming up. Well, I hope so. And um, you know, I hope that they have. I've had a. I've been blessed in my career. I've had a lot of wonderful people who become friends, who become mentors, and whatever. And I hope that the women coming up will have similar circumstances, and I'm sure they will, because it makes all the difference. It does. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm.